official.streetsmarks at gmail.com is how you want to contact us. Listen to us right here exclusively on YouTube, Street Smart Audio. Or fuck with us. Official.streetsmarks on IG. Official.streetsmarks on SoundCloud. Street Smart Facebook. <laughs> Street, <laughs> Street Smart fan page on Facebook. Street underscore Smarks on Twitter. This is the Extreme Retro Review for ECW. Timeline 1993, hosted by Kayfabe Commentaries and narrated by Todd Gordon. Wood, what were your uh, overall thoughts about this uh, this this new format that you that you saw? This is this is pretty much your first time ever watching a timeline series. Yeah, it, um, it was. Um, I saw th- um, a snippet of. Um, some of it on YouTube, mm-hmm. like on ha- happenstance or whatever. But yeah, just to watch it straight through, it was first one. I thought it was well done. I thought it was awesome. I actually, because it's a two-year timeline, the whole show. It's actually ninety-two and ninety-three. Mm-hmm. And um, um, as I alluded to during the review of the last show of the year, I actually watched and reviewed um, the uh, nineteen ninety-two and. It, and so, I view it as a whole, 92 or 93, and I just, I thought it was awesome. Because, you know, I haven't reviewed starting with Battle of the Belts, and then we just finished up the last review for 1993. And it, I didn't, it didn't click in my brain that it was a whole calendar year, like basically, well, except for a, a hiatus in there, but right. it started in January, mm-hmm. and... We did a whole year. So, anyway, I'm getting a little long-winded, but I thought it was awesome. Uh, it was very informative, it, and it was nice to get a peek behind behind the scenes and see what some of the thought process was for a lot of the things that uh, was going on in their beginnings. In an earlier Street Smart discussion, I told my compatriot about uh, how I... Um, asked the question for the son of Yushu. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And that's uh, Yushu is a format that Kayfabe Commentary also does. So, um, a little synergy in our podcast. Um, I buried Sean Oliver <laughs> because he tried to fucking out me as a creeper. <laughs> and now I'm reviewing his show. Overall, the show sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, Hollywood, take it away. Oh, shoot. All right. So, um, 1993, um, they start with the uh, Battle of the Belts. Um, and one thing I have for, forgot and that I thought about, uh, they was talking about how basically it was Carrie Von, er- Carrie Von Erich's last ever show on Earth, period. And what a goof he was, because he was coming out as a mystery wrestler. But he had on a jacket that said Carrie. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I remember distinctly watching uh, Battle of the Belts for the review. And I, first thing I'm thinking, why does Carrie Von Erich have a mask on? <laughs> And why does he have the carry jacket you know, on? Who is he fooling? Right. You is know he trying to fool me? Because <laughs> I didn't bite Carrie. Rest in peace. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he has on the Carry Von Eric wrestling gear with the jacket. Um, okay. So um anyway. And um am I just am I doing the whole thing? Yeah, go. Oh, all right. So um they they um some of the different highlights they were showing over the, for January um, was Funk and Gilbert. They main evented the Battle of the Belt show. Right. And just thought it was very, very fitting because, you know, well, I guess fitting in hindsight because um, uh, Gilbert's last scheduled match in ECW was involved in a match with Terry Funk, even though. It didn't go down at um, Ultra Clash, if I'm not mistaken. No, uh, they had the... Oh, yeah, it didn't go down at Ultra Clash because of uh, he left the company, mm-hmm. but he wanted to come out 
and say goodbye to the fans or whatnot. But we'll get into that as right, as we right. as we go on. Right, right. So yeah, so um, yeah, they didn't. Um, so yeah, they had battle of other belts, and then they didn't have a shelf until April. Right. So at the time, uh, Ty's talking about how he had to secure a secure facility. Um, uh, they weren't at the ECW Arena at this time because they were at the Caprini College. Right, and, you know, right. So they were in the gymnasium or whatnot. And uh, so they had to secure that. They had to secure a TV slot, so they had to talk to Sports Channel. And uh, they talked about how Sports Channel didn't have... They didn't get paid for Sports Channel. They didn't pay Sports Channel. They just needed uh, a slot to fill, a time slot to fill. Oh. And they needed 44 <laughs> minutes or whatnot. And then um, so when they are trying to fill... Uh, you know, fill the the venue for the first show. Mm-hmm. It was a it was spring break, and it was like a thirty uh, a thirty inch snowfall. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember Gordon bitching about that. <laughs> right, so he said he had all the people come in and uh, fit to one side on the hard camera, so it looked like the, the, the venue was at least somewhat full. <laughs> right, and had to work to, work to the side. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, man. Now, I mean, you know, humble beginnings for ECW. Oh, yeah. But it wouldn't stay humble for long because on April 6th, it was the debut episode of their hardcore TV. Um, so I, I presume that was their first show for Sports Channel. Right. That was, that's, when it, uh, that's when it actually aired. Uh, they actually they taped it in March. That's during the spring break time, but it aired, you know, saying they had to get the edited down. You know, Todd's trying to run, you know, Carver W. Reed at the same time. Right, he has a business to run. So he's trying to, he can't book full time, so that's how he brings Eddie in. Um, Eddie comes in to book for him. Smart decision. And he learns learns the ropes and they become fast friends. That's good stuff, because speaking of Eddie... It, on not only is is it the debut episode of ECW uh, television, but it is also the debut of Hot Stuff International when the one and only first ECW heavyweight champion, Jimmy the, J- Jimmy the Superfly Snooker, joins forces with Eddie Gilbert and forms Hot Stuff International. Uh, Hot Stuff International... Uh very uh, tantamount to the beginning of ECW. You you damn right. Uh, they held most of the belts. Come on, somebody. <laughs> uh, but they had to have a eternal foil. So also debuting was Terry Funk. Terry Funk came into the to the promotion uh, as a commentator, and Funk and Gilbert had their little spats on air to go Terry Funk into uh, coming out of retirement, so to speak, and to <laughs> wrestle in the ring. Oh, somehow I didn't put that in my notes. Remember the Quantum Leap episodes that they had to show? I do remember. <laughs> they had a... <laughs> terrible. They were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about... He's a terrible actor. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about... We were trying to give a Quantum Leap synopsis and shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> didn't know what the fuck we were talking about. Because I never watched Quantum Leap. Oh man, yeah, it's hard. Oh boy, to, it's hard to get into. But you know the gist of it, though. I think everybody. Knows I mean, yeah, the right. Gist of right. it, right? Mm, you know, guys uh, hops into other people's bodies to try to right wrongs and shit. Who cares? Yeah. Anyway, it's every episode. Right. So, <laughs> moving on, we, we get into May, and we got a uh, Paulie, Paulie coming in in the May. Not before we had a uh, Snooker became. They had to do the TV title tournament. Right, right. You know, Snooker won that. Right. Because they had to establish the title, and they didn't want to put it on a on a Jamook like Glenn Osborne. While they were talking about um, Glenn Osborne, um, I want to say Todd said something that alluded to the fact that Hot Stuff International might not have been the best thing for ECW, or because he was saying something about Eddie wanting to have all the the big names with him or something. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if uh, it's more of a Booker's curse. You know what I'm saying? Especially if the Booker is a performer. Okay. Okay, Booker wants to... Uh, because the Booker's there. The Booker um, knows that he's not going to leave the promotion. So the Booker is always going to book himself strong. Because he knows he's not leaving. 
That's why Jerry Lawler was always a, a infinity time champion in Memphis. Because, you know, Makes he, sense. he booked. He booked there. Mm. You know, um, that's why um, Eddie, you know, surrounded himself with the top, you know, with the best talent. because Or the most over talent. Because it only made him better. It made everybody else better. Mm -hmm. um, and all in all, I mean, Todd can say that, oh, it was a bad idea. But who else was going to carry the company? Because a company is only defined by its heels. You gotta, you gotta make baby faces. You got Terry Funk as your lead baby face. Ugh. Who is this? Who is the lead heel? Eddie Mother Freaking Gilbert. Right. So if you want to surround yourself with Eddie, and he's a heel. He's going to surround himself with a top talent. You know, Kevin Nash, when he was booking in WCW, he booked himself. Uh, he politicked himself into beating Goldberg. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and went over a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? In in in, in, in retrospect. <coughs> so um, Dusty Rhodes did the same thing Dusty was uh, booking in for Crockett and he always was at the top of the card and he always kept uh, powerful people around him uh, Nikita, uh, the Road Warriors oh, and uh, Magnum TA okay, okay. you know what I'm saying so it's, it's not um, what Todd's saying about Eddie is not without precedent gotcha. you know what I'm saying so you, uh, you can just chalk it up for Todd just being a goof and, and not knowing the business. <laughs> okay, I got you. Because I'm like, shoot. I mean, because had he known, I mean, he'd have been like, oh, okay. Uh, oh, I get it. <laughs> He's a booker. It makes sense. You know? <laughs> Booker's curse. <laughs> Moving on. I got you. I got you. Oh, man. So, um, okay, yeah. So, yeah, that's oh yeah, only little thing about the... Oh, I want to mention about April real quick and shit. Because the other than that, on the 27th, Candido and Hot Body joined forces to make the Suicide Blondes. Oh, hey, you want to talk about uh, the tag team situation in ECW 93 was terrible. Uh-huh. Um, it had no clear direction. I mean, we started out with the Super D's and Lay Moulet. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? We went on to the Suicide Blondes. Mm -hmm. Then they had the, the Freebird rule going on with the Suicide Blondes. Right. Candido breaks his arm and powders to Smoky Mountain. Uh-huh. Then they reformed the, uh, the do-rags. Stetson and uh, <laughs> Hot Body. Bad Company comes in. And coincidentally, those guys never do a job on TV together. You know what I'm saying? So not going to do a job by himself. Diamond will do a job by himself. But putting those guys together on TV and having them do a job never happens. Oh, they were because they did a job at uh, I think they did a job at Holiday Hell for the body count. Oh, the explosion man! Right, sure. they, they had to do a job there. But obviously, coincidentally, uh, Holiday Hell was it was it uh soul? You see what I'm saying? Which was stupid. I'm just saying, um, you know, it it just it just it just so happens that the shows that we aren't able to see. The uh, name guys are doing jobs. Huh. Interesting. You know, but uh, as far as Candido and, and Hot Body, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They did, they did a free birthday with Chris Michaels, who is pretty most, pretty much the most bland heel ever yeah. in the face of the promotion. It, he was worthless. <laughs> he was completely worthless. How he even managed to keep a job well into 93 astounds me because he's terrible. He had no charisma. Like, even when Rock and Rebel bitched him out and shit, like, it was like, I was waiting. He should have been a fiery baby face other than that. Nobody cared. They still wanted Wild Man, wild man Sal. <sighs> right. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. So, May 4th, Paulie, or the May 4th episode, Paulie makes his ECW. Uh, television debut and shit. Obviously, uh, that's you know that's historic. Yeah, you, you know, know what I'm saying the, sh the, the show sucked. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We said the show actually was good in comparison. You know what I'm saying, but obviously the show sucked. Right. But Paulie was there, so it's, he saved it. I guess he was Captain Save a Show for that show. Yeah. <laughs> he got a good promo. I transcribed it. Uh, hit up one of the early ECW episodes. I think it's like five or six. You know what I'm saying y'all y'all know where to find us. Um, shoot. So. Um, Oh, so the June first episode where Paul Lee replaces Stevie Wonderful on color and shit. So apparently he just flat out thought Stevie sucked 
And they legit, I mean, in hindsight, it, it looks like they re legit replaced him on camera. But they, <laughs> you, that shit, no doubt. They replaced this dude on camera and shit. Yeah, so uh, Stevie Wonderful came in as the sound guy. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of musical equipment or whatever, whatever. And he'd play the guy's music, you know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, he, he, he was also doubling as a heel manager back in the TWA days. So they brought him on as color for Jay Sully. Jay Sully, uh, Todd says he doesn't know where Jay Sully came from. <laughs> he was just he was just around and they, he was the most decent guy. He was just the guy who won by default. And he doesn't drink, apparently. Yeah, so this, <laughs> they, the six-pack gimmick was a work and all that shit. But, uh, but yeah, uh, Stevie Wonderful um, comes in as a sound guy, heel manager, and uh, eventually color commentator. But High Stuff says he sucks. <laughs> I mean, rightfully so. I mean, he's not good. I mean, he's okay. He had, like, one call that we said that, that we actually called on air. Um you know, but who cares? <coughs> uh, so Paulie um, swapping him out and putting him back where he needs to be, either in them back with the music or outside with the fans. Uh, it was a good move because you needed to grow. You got Paulie there and you got Stevie Wonderful. Come on, who are you going with? I mean, yeah, but dang, don't do him like that. Dude. Look. They're, they're not called the Wonderful Awards, okay? Yeah. <laughs> they're called the Sully Awards. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm talking about replace Holmes on camera, though. Like, at least Yo. give him, like, hey, this is your last show, fam. Or, you know, said, at least do something like that. Especially since Todd was hesitant to do it. I'm cool. To do it since he'd been with, there from the beginning and shit. You know, said, if you, you got to grow the company. I mean, it, I mean, it's just it's just growing pains. I mean, either you reassign him to do something that's that accentuates his strengths, music, or you gotta go. Yeah, I would say, yeah, that's cool. But don't replace the nigga on air and shit. Just be like, hey, go go to the back and then he go to the back. Like, hey, shit. he should have went to Corluzo. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if, if it was such a big fucking deal, he could have went to Corluzo and worked Corluzo's shitty shows. Okay. I'm just saying. Whatever. That's how you do a nigga that's loyal and shit? No. That's how we reassign motherfuckers to put them where they need to be, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got Jay Sully and J uh, Stevie Wonderful, and they're fucking just tanking the shows. The shows already <laughs> suck, but at least with a good commentator, you know, Jim Ross can make a shit match decent. Yeah. Okay? So Joey okay. Styles can make a shit match decent. Come on, okay? somebody. Jay Sully can make a shit match shittier. <laughs> That's not a good skill to have. All right? And Stevie Wonderful <laughs> is going to make it the shittiest. So, who are we going to replace? Jay Sully is at least decent. I mean, he's going to sit there and not call the, uh, the moves, right? You know, he's going to be like, what do you call that, Paulie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a big right hand. <laughs> so, why on earth do we have Maddie in the house? Now, I know he's not doing color or nothing, but we see seeing this nigga 20 times a a 44 minute show and shit. I thought the motherfucker had a stake in the company early, obviously. I thought it was Matt Radico, but it's not Matt Radico. Maddie in the house and Matt Radico are obviously two different people, so let that be known for you super geeks. <laughs> oh, is that like a, a rumor or a I mean, it's not a rumor or anything, it's just for the motherfuckers who are going to be listening to the shit, they're going to be like, well, is Maddie in the house and Matt Radico the same people? And then they start spitting off some knowledge, thinking that they. You know, say ECW smart. I'm going to squash that shit right now. The two different people. And try Move to on. Put two and two together. Right. And shit, but getting five. Yeah. But uh, June 1st and June 8th uh, episodes was our 10th uh, reviews. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we had Mad Jack Slater in the house for the first for the first show, which he didn't uh, watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> Goof. <laughs> Goof. <laughs> hey, but I, I've. Feel your pain, though, Ja. Oh. <coughs> Don't let it happen again. Oh. <laughs> but not only that, but it was also the first time ECW crowned a Pennsylvania Heavyweight Championship, won by the one and only Tommy Cairo. whoop de doo Who earned his place at the company by impressing in his first match for free. And I think 
he ended up having his first two matches be for free. So he's a super mark because he worked for free. So anyway, Tommy Cairo won in a battle royal, the Sandusky mm -hmm. title that we affectionately <laughs> renamed because it was uh, never defended. It was defended one time, I think, against uh, Stetson. And Stetson beat him for it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was just squashed after that. They tried to have a Maryland state champ. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm th <clears throat> See, I, I was waiting for this to come out, to, uh, to for this to be put out here. You see how we kept it on the DL and stuff. But the first Maryland heavyweight champion, J.T. Smith, uh, because why? Because Hot Stuff International makes sure that JT keep eating out here. You know what I'm saying? So he was eating out here. He's the Maryland heavyweight champion. And that's, we can't call that the Sandusky championship. So on behalf of Hot Stuff International, you're welcome. We can call it the Eric Garner championship. Well, that's, that's, oh. Uh, <coughs> Oh, damn. The scourge of the IWC. <laughs> yeah. So moving uh, on. Yeah. Um, so, the Sizzler. Yeah, Summer's Sizzler Spectacular. <laughs> the the, ECW's first supercard. Yeah, so uh, Todd wanted to have a supercard of his own. Mm -hmm. um, by now, they're in the ECW arena. Um, so he wanted to showcase his talent that was respective to the ECW arena and the ECW crowd. Um mm -hmm. The guys who were uh, prominent in the business, the Morocco's, the Snookers, they would uh, make sure that their dates were clear so they could make ECW dates. So it uh, seems to me that they were making money. Mm -hmm. you know right, what I'm saying? They had, right. they had uh, noted on there that they were adding seats in the bleachers because um, because demand of ECW was was uh, trending upward. Um, so they uh, had the Super Summer Sizzler Spectacular uh, highlighted, main evented by uh, Terry Funk. And High Stuff Eddie Gilbert in a Texas Chain Match Massacre. That's right. For the title of King of Philadelphia. That's right. And that's that was the night that Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert became a king. That's when he became royalty. That's when he became majestic. That's when he became the king of Philadelphia. So after some chicanery... Chicanery. It was a, a match with no rules, so therefore it is impossible for it to be chicanery. Referee Kevin Christian was uh, outed as uh, helping shout, Eddie Gilbert. Shout out Big Kev. Those allegations are allegations. And he gets fired by Todd Gordon, who recreases himself as fearless. Freddie Gilbert. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, Freddie. Oh, man. Also, <laughs> also on the card, um, Angel showed her to Taz. Ah, yeah. The highlight of the show for me. I mean, even above Eddie being the king of Philadelphia, like, because I was, I did not see that coming. And on the timeline, um, Apparently, um, well, a couple of things I didn't find out. I found out first. I didn't know Don Morocco was the ECW champion before um, his before he joined us at Hot Stuff International. So that was interesting. Yeah, I think he beat, beat Snooker for the title. Mm -hmm. Fellow Hot Stuff International member. That's that's right. You know, what I'm saying the, that a little beef, but you know, Eddie brings people together. You know, what I'm saying. But anyway, so I did not know Tigra used to be a strip, or she was a stripper. Right. So Tigra was a stripper, right? Yeah. So um, Ty books the, the the loser get stripped battle royal, whatever, whatever, and he's figuring, okay, Tigra's a stripper, so it'll be easier, you know, to, you know, have a stripper strip and mm -hmm. do the job. Mm -hmm. So in the back, a couple weeks before the show, Peaches starts uh, getting mouthy. Talking about, oh. I'm not going to strip in front of anybody. There's kids out there. So she spins fucking uh, Tigra up. And Tigra, the stripper, does not want to strip because there's going to be kids in the crowd. I would have fired Peaches on the spot. On the freaking spot. 
No, um, no hesitation, no argument. If Sandman had a problem with that, he would have been fired too. Yeah, no, ain't tolerating the, um, insubordination. I don't care. Uh, as long as you work for my promotion, if I tell you to whip them titties out, you gonna you better ask me which one. And I'm going to say both of them because I love titties. And I love areolas and I love the nipples. How is Touching Tatas doing? Touching Tatas? Um, <clears throat> so while you look that up, mm -hmm. Angel comes out and says, I'll do it. And she's 19, so I guess she's legal. And uh, she gets oh, a, there's no guessing. She's definitely legal. Well, her, her Tatas are very legal because when she gets stripped, by Rebel and fucking uh, Stetson. She gives a quick flash to the crowd. Todd tells a story about some kid fucking becoming a fan for life because he saw the tits. I didn't mm -hmm. see it. I mean, I saw the tits, but I didn't see the kid. I didn't, wasn't the... I wasn't really paying attention yeah, to the fucking kid. <laughs> right. It's not like I was gonna go back and be like, hey, what's this kid looking at? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm here to see the titties too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're all on the titty page. I may not be the Pooty Poon Pulverizer. <laughs> oh, man. But you can like titties too. But I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, Angel shows the tits, and uh, the crowd pops. You know, the crowd pops for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for, for the spot. And that's the sizzler in the nutshell because all the other matches suck. Yeah. Pretty much. And uh, only other notable thing is Dick Murdoch made his one and only ECW appearance at the Spectacular. Oh, and that's when uh, Terry Funk was on commentary and he was like, oh, he, uh, he, I, I, lo I love Dick Murdoch. Yeah. He's the greatest. <laughs> he's an idiot, but I love him anyway. The yeah. great right hand. Oh, he's not, he doesn't have the best body in the world and he's an idiot. You know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, no wonder Paul said what he said about uh, his daughter's looking like Dick Murdoch. <laughs> and being from Canyon, Texas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not to mention the sex sexual deviancy. Mm -hmm. And it all stems from Terry being a terrible father. So, you know, it's only common sense that that would unfold like that. Uh, anyway, enough about freaking Terry. So, um... um some reason it was a big deal about Todd getting knocked out at the end of a July 20th show. Um, I guess that's where he was involved in the melee and with Sal Balomo or somebody accidentally bumped into <laughs> him and stuff. Yeah, so in uh, July 20th, <laughs> my bad, no, take so two. Good. So the July 20th show, um, they had a, a series of brawls to end the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, Todd's over there. He would start, this is during the time where he's talking about he's going to start levying fines and suspensions. Oh, right, but right. The, and that's because he got knocked out by Hot Body and Belomo <laughs> to, end the, to end the show. It was a, it was a terrible show. Yeah. <laughs> All these shows are terrible in 93. <laughs> like, literally. I, I think we've seen, what, 30, what, we're on, what, this is a uh, retro review, we're on, what, 43, 44, something like that. Mm -hmm. Literally, 40 of them have been terrible. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, and, and to include uh, uh, Ultra Clash. But before Ultra Clash, setting up Ultra Clash was um, J.T. Smith falling off the fucking scaffold Yeah, from Dark Patriot. Yeah, apparently um, um, he was legit hurt from that. Yeah, I, I guess Ty tells a story about how he came back, you know, because uh, J.T. worked at Carver W. Reed, mm -hmm. and uh, I relayed that earlier in, in, a, in a retro review. And... Uh, he came back with his knee all swollen up, <laughs> taking a dive off the fucking uh, Eagle's Nest. And that was like the first holy shit spot of, uh, for ECW. Before that, they had the fireball, but the fireball doesn't really get uh, talked about that much. Hulk came into the promotion, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They don't really talk about Hulk, uh, Hulk being in ECW. I mean, they talk about the locker room, you know what I'm saying? Hulk would always talk about how his locker room was, how, how the ECW locker room was together and they were a family and shit like that. And then Hulk would no show shows because he was locked up in the fucking uh, the mountains getting half uh, cocaine, or crack cocaine. Turning up. Right. Turning the fuck up. But in June, uh, you see High Stuff International uh, pretty much solidifying, you know, gaining members, uh, doing heel shit. Basically carrying the company all the way into Ultra Clash. That's right. That's what we did. That's what we do. You 
you know what I'm saying? I gained a few members. I gained the Dark Patriot, uh, who was Doug Gilbert under the mask. Um, and Freddie Gilbert, after the, uh, the sizzling debacle. <laughs> so you had Morocco as the heavyweight champ. That's right. Snooker was the TV champ. That's right. Uh, Eddie Gilbert was the king of Philadelphia. That's right. In conjunction with the Dangerous Alliance was the mouthpiece, Paulie Dangerously. He, he, when he had good sense. Right, and uh, rounding out the bunch was Freddie Gilbert and Dark Patriot. Uh, they basically carried the company all the way into Ultra Clash. Um, That's, but, I'm, I'm not in my head in agreement for those who don't see But ultimately, um, Eddie and Todd have a falling out. Yeah. Uh, the drug use is getting uh, progressive for Eddie, and he's not showing up to work. And plus... Uh, they're they're in talks with the NWA. Yeah, and uh, Eddie Gilbert is vehemently anti NWA because it is like Crockett. So in a in a fluster, he in a kerfuffle in a kerfuffle <laughs> kerfuffle. <laughs> he leaves the company. So why does he not like NWA and Crockett? Um. So, there's a multitude of reasons. One stems from Kevin Sullivan. They just have heat. Okay. I'm not... I, does Kevin Sullivan try to fuck Missy Hyatt? I don't know. Um, but they have heat because Eddie was on the booking committee. Kevin's on the booking committee. And obviously, they bumped heads somewhere along the line. Eddie bounces. Okay. Uh, Crockett at the time wants to start the World Wrestling Network. Um, which is very uh, ahead of its time. It's supposed to be streaming in high definitions. Cable television show is supposed to be 24-7. Let's oh, see what the WWE Network is, but on the cable. Oh, wow. Um, and Paul Lee was going to be the booker. He was just using his time as uh, on ECW to help with promos because Eddie and Paul Lee came up in the business together. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Eddie was the second generation guy, Tough Tommy's son. Um, so he already has a foot in, in, in Memphis, having his hand on the book. Uh, Paul Lee, by this point, had already been a photographer. He'd already uh, came in to Memphis, and he's starting getting into the business, uh, managing people like uh, Mean Mark and uh, Crusher Broomfield and, and, and the, the new uh, Midnight Express. Okay. 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 So they link up together. I guess, you know, they hit it off or whatnot. But these guys are to be like the next wave of creative guys in the business, you know, Eddie and Paulie, okay. But uh, Todd is in the way of Paul because Todd has money. Oh, okay. Paulie has no money. Okay. And you know he he Paulie he being Paulie latched himself to Eddie Gilbert because Eddie was always going to have a foothold in the business due to being second generation, due to working Memphis in creative and working Mid-South in creative because uh, Jerry Jarrett is highly respected as a promoter and Bill Watts is highly respected as a promoter. And if you book for them, you're pretty much fast-tracking yourself as uh, as a creative guy and one of the big two. Okay, okay. So Paul Lee hitches himself to that wagon. Makes sense. Because Paul Lee was just a photographer in New York. You know what I'm saying? He was just... Get sneaking into Madison Square Garden and taking pictures. Damn. You know what I'm saying? So now he gets into the business. Hey, hey, Eddie, hey, Eddie, how you doing, guy? Eddie, how you doing? You know? We're chummy, we're chummy, we're, we're friends, we're pals. I go where you go. You go where I go. Yeah, 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 no problem. They make it up to Eastern. They're in Philadelphia. Philly's a hot skip and a, jort, hop, skip and a jump to New York. So he's almost home. Because Paul always wanted to be in New York as a wrestling czar. So Philly, kind of close, but I need to get to the money. Todd has money. So let me get chummy with Todd real quick. I don't really need Eddie no more because now I got a money guy with a guy who has TV and a guy who has creative direction. Well, I have creative direction. I'm Paul fucking Heyman. You know what I'm saying? So now I get Eddie out of the fucking way. Eddie self-destructs between him and Todd. Now he just slim, slimes his way in. Now he, and now it's Todd and Paul. Okay? Uh-huh. So now we're going forward. Todd and Paul become inseparable. He elbowed Eddie out of the way. Oh, shit. Ain't that a bitch? Yeah. 
Not really. Uh. Because when he's working with the promo guys, he's working with these young guys. He said, I'll get you this promo. I can make you. You know what I'm saying? I can make you Sandman. I can make you Tommy Dreamer. I can make you Tasmaniac. I can make you Sabu. I can make these guys. And when you make these guys, who are they going to be loyal to? Eddie? Or are they going to be loyal to Paul? The guy who helped them make money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So all the guys start getting loyal to Paul. And he's out. Now it's Todd and Paul. Keep moving. Makes sense. Then Eddie would feel alienated and shit because that's... And you got... And you got... I'm sorry. And you have Todd in talks with the NWA. Uh Uh-huh. And you got Todd, you got Paul Lee working, trying to work this, because uh, he's going to be the booker for the WWE and if Crockett gets this shit off, you know, off the ground, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So all the merger, you know what I'm saying? Because, and, and so Paul, when he's making these guys, he has a pipeline system to the WWE. In. So he's back in the business. And Eddie, on the other hand, is out the business because he hates Crockett, he hates Sullivan, so it's gone. That's why Todd booked Sullivan in Eddie's place for Ultra Clash. Piss him off. Exactly. Cold blood, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, the official dates on that are September 3rd, ECW joins the NWA. Mm-hmm. And September 7th, Eddie quits ECW, um, citing uh, them joining the NWA as reasons why he quit. And then September 9th, Shane wins the title on a phantom title change from Tito Santana. So Tito Santana beat Don Morocco for the ECW title on TV. Um, But Tito's not long for the company. And in previous wrestling reviews, I didn't know if Tito was going back as the Matador. You know what I'm saying? But he did the Matador gimmick in 91. Oh, sh- sh- yeah, so I was completely oh. the fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so for some yeah. various retro reviews, I'm over here sounding like a complete goof. So he was on the downhill then. Right. <laughs> so he does the job. Uh, uh, Morocco does the job. No big deal. He's out the company. Uh-huh. Um, and then, uh, but they got, and then Tito is out the company uh, uh, as well. So who he gives the belt to? Who's the best guy you got on the roster at the point? Member of Hot Stuff International, the fabulous Shane Douglas. Right, so fabulous Shane Douglas comes in to do the title switch in Roanoke, Virginia, I believe. Uh Uh-huh, that's right. Uh, On a retro review, I think we cited uh, Argentina or fucking uh, (laughs) South America somewhere. (laughs) Same fucking difference. (laughs) Right. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, you go with Shane because he's the best guy you got. That's right. Um, And uh, that's no, no other way around it. And he's connected. I mean, like I said, again, I know Eddie quit about a week prior, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, two days prior, but at this point, it's still Hot Stuff International, still the most connected group in wrestling, and we have the crown jewel, the the next crown jewel, because, you know what I'm saying, Eddie rolled out, but next best thing is Shane Douglas, who was recommended and basically brought in by our leader and founder, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. All right, so Eddie leaves the company. Mm-hmm. We're at Ultra Clash now. Uh-huh. Um, so Paulie, uh, it's said that Paulie doesn't book Ultra Clash. Uh, Todd books it. I don't. I don't buy it. I'm figuring Paulie has his fingers all through Ultra Clash as far as uh, progressing the show. Um, Public Enemy debut. They beat Jason Knight and Ian Rotten. Yeah. Thoughts on on Public Enemy so far? Man. I mean, they're... Yeah, man. They're all right. They beat beat the guys with a complete squidosh. Uh, Axel had always uh, lamented in shoot interviews, uh, currently on the Extreme Project, that uh, he didn't want Ian to wrestle because... That he knew that Public Enemy was coming coming in, and they were coming in to squash whoever they whoever they were uh, fighting. So it was like, because it was supposed to be Axel, I mean uh, Public Enemy versus Bad Breed in okay. a squash. Oh wow! Axel was like, "No, I ain't doing it." <laughs> so Axel, you know, saying no showed. Ian was like, "Fuck that! I'm gonna get paid thirty five bucks." 
<laughs> Give me that money. Right. And then Jason <laughs> came through and they both they both job. Ooh. You know, so this was quick. Yeah, I guess. It's easy um, money. <laughs> so with no uh Eddie Gilbert on the card, uh Kevin Sullivan refla- replaced uh Eddie Gilbert in the uh the bunkhouse match. It was uh Stan Hansen and Funk against uh Abby and Eddie, but Kevin Sullivan uh replaced Eddie in the match. Tried to replace right. Eddie. Eddie ended up coming out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But uh and the match was the shits. The whole show was the shits. Don't let people tell you that Ultra Clash was revolutionary. It was garbage. <laughs> it was garbage. What, did somebody say that? Dude, they said like Ultra Clash was revolutionary. It was revolutionary because Paul Lee took the book. But other than that, as a show, it was, it was garbage. No, Summer Sizzler Spectacular was revolutionary because it had titties. Right. Uh, Ultra Clash, all they had was uh, JT falling off the scaffold. Damn, almost killing himself. Right? And crippled. Hell if I bump, though. But uh, Joey Styles made his debut at uh, Ultra Clash. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why they cite it as being revolutionary. But uh, outside outside of that, it was it was a terrible show. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Right? So we had some uh, clip shows, skip shows, mm-hmm. moving forward towards Blood Feast. Yep, October 1st. Yeah, and second. Uh, Blood Feast is uh, the worst show of all time. <laughs> because they sold this show as uh, in a clip form. The match was all jumbled the fuck around. Oh, yeah. Joey's doing the shit in oh, post-production. Oh. And all the matches fucking end up being on the shows from 10-5 all the way to 11-2. So apparently Sabu didn't want to do the Hannibal Lecter entrance. No. So Sabu uh, coming over from uh, uh, Wing, mm-hmm. FMW, he wanted to uh, make a splash in the States. Paul Lee gave him the Hannibal Lecter uh, entrance to the ring Paul, uh, with 911 as handler. He was unnamed at this point. He was just Sabu's handler. <laughs> <laughs> but... uh. Sabu didn't want to do it because it expended too much energy. He would blow himself up on the way to the ring. You know, he had to do all his flips and shit. Um, but Paulie ended up paying him more. Oh. So he did it. Oh, wow. And but he hated doing it, though. Oh, imagine that. Yeah. Uh, Blood Feast was also the, uh, the debut for Tommy Dreamer, Putz. Yeah, absolutely. And a Tasmaniac. Tasmanian fought Sabu in that match. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a piece of shit match, I, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Dreamer also fought Tasmaniac later on, I think, on night two. Mm-hmm. It was a terrible match as well. And they tried to start pushing him over as the script. Uh, he has heart. Right. Storyline babyface. Mm-hmm. Again. There it is. Storyline babyface. As we leave 93 and go into 94, I will explain... Storyline babyface, storyline heel, match babyface, match heel for you. And you will understand and why these matches have so much gravitas later on in the promotion. Ah, uh, gravitas. Right. Um, overall, uh, Blood Feast was the worst show of all time, as I uh, said previously. Um, so we're going to move on. Wholeheartedly agree. Right. So, October 16th is when the aforementioned Maryland show happened. And that's when J.T. Smith won the Battle Royal and was crowned the Maryland State Heavyweight Champion. To lift a phrase from my compatriot, Mm -hmm. they was trying to make sure he eat out here. That's right. You are, y'all already know, you know what I'm saying? He eating good because he a motherfucking champ. Moving on. So then after the <sighs> November 2nd was when that idiot Terry Funk turned on J.T. Smith when he just exposed what a terrible mentor he was. We already know he's a terrible wrestler, a terrible actor. And now it's without proof that, he, I mean, without shadow of a doubt, undeniable proof he is a terrible mentor he's a terrible father um i could keep going on and on but i'm not going to bear it um 
Boreal with that. But the whole point of this pairing apparently was to take um, Funk's experience and use it to make um, J.T. Smith better and stuff. Why, of all people, would you want to join Terry Funk with anyone in the hopes of making them a better wrestler? Well, um, Terry is, after Eddie Gilbert left the company, uh, Terry Funk is your most named guy. So if you want to make somebody, you make somebody with somebody who's already made. Terry Funk is made, so hopefully you try to make JT Smith. Unfortunately, it did not work. Even though he still eats out here. <laughs> That's right. But uh, uh, the goal of Terry Funk as we leave 93 is to make Sabu and to make Shane Douglas. Because those are the guys who are going to be drawing you the most money going forward. Um, so after the Funk heel turn on November 2nd, that was previously, uh, uh, mentioned in Blood Feast, Funk goes on a tirade, he, he joins up with the bad breed, has his few good men, <sighs> and he starts gunning for Sabu for, uh, both titles, because at this point, Sabu beats, uh, Shane for the title. And he becomes the ECW heavyweight title, uh, heavyweight champion, as well as the TV champion mm -hmm. at the November to Remember, which we never saw. That's right. But at the same time, Funk is still going on with Shane because at Holiday Hell, Shane beat, uh, Shane helped Funk beat Sabu for the title. So there's that. So I just want to throw in while you had mentioned November to remember, we finally figured out what happened to Medusa. So apparently she no showed because she had got signed to the then WWF as Alondra Blaze. As Alondra Blaze, and so I guess she either didn't want to or couldn't honor her commitment. Um, um, Todd didn't really go into full detail other than just, you know. They wanted to talk about uh, how, how, we, how we recounted on the uh, previous Retro Reviews how Sherry and Medusa were supposed to fight in November to remember. Mm -hmm. um, they had a, a uh, sit-down, face-to-face promo oh, yeah. at John Arezzi's wrestling convention. <laughs> and... Uh, Medusa cuts a terrible promo. Sherry responds, talking about how she fucked Greg all the time. <laughs> He's all right. Now, as a matter of fact, he was the one thing she did right, apparently. Right? So, uh, you know, they supposedly have the match, but, you know, Medusa no shows because she signs with WWF. And then fucking uh, Sherry beats up some Japanese chick so bad that she cuts her eye and she's mm. the first woman who bleeds in North America. That's wrestling. right. Damn, I don't remember her name. Right. I thought it was Malia Obama. <laughs> um, oh, shoot. Or Malia Osaka. <laughs> Whatever. <Yeah>. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, heading on into December, we got a fucking uh, putz. Tommy Dreamer, he's a tag team champion with Johnny, Johnny Gunn. And Johnny Gunn fails to make any appearance in ECW the whole fucking time. Uh, they lose the belts to the Kevin Sullivan and the Tasmaniac. Yeah, what was up with Johnny Gunn and shit? I guess Johnny Gunn felt he was too big for ECW and didn't want to fucking show up and be shown on television. Who is Johnny Gunn? Again, Salvatore Sinceri and oh. Tom Brandy. WWF jobber in the Attitude Era. Okay. Um. Wow. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, wow. wow. Again, the, the tag team titles ping ponged all fucking year, and uh, they eventually settled on Kevin Sullivan and the Taz Maniac, even though um, Public Enemy were gunning for them eventually. But you still had to get Public Enemy over, mm -hmm. so they had him in a series of fucking vignettes trying oh. to get the characters over, where they tried to steal Manny in the house car. They tried to fucking uh, you know. Claimed that they were from the hood and shit. They went to jail. They went to fucking jail. They beat up Bad Company. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
Speaking of the hood, you had Mr. He Mr. Hughes debut in the ECW. Yeah. With his one promo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was uh he was managed by Jason. He's a he was a bad man. Yeah. Sidewalk slam. Right, he beat Lex Luger. He, he, you know what I'm saying? He He's, beat He stole <laughs> the turn. And uh that. Johnny Gunn, you're gonna go down with the sidewalk slam. Yeah. <laughs> Never knew if Johnny Gunn ever went down with the sidewalk slam. But uh I didn't see Johnny Gunn go down with the sidewalk slam. I never seen Johnny Gunn go down. Period. <laughs> it is that. that motherfucker said, nah. He must have got a Nostradamus vision and said, Paulie's going to be bouncing checks in a few yeah. years. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Vince. I'm not going to waste my time. Right? Fucking, uh, yeah, we end up uh, 93. Fucking uh, Funk has the belt back. We beat Shane. <sighs> or he beat Sabu with uh, Shane's help. Terrible. I mean, they're setting up for the three-way at uh, the night the line was crossed. That would be in February 94. Hallelujah. Uh, that, that public is... enemies gunning for the tag team champions, Kevin Sullivan and the Tasmaniac. And Sabu is still the ECW television champion. Okay, yeah. Um, ECW is in a terrible place right now. I know Sullivan and Taz are okay, but everything uh, uh, else. The only thing I like is their post-match shtick when they fucking... Uh, do the orgasm and the fake orgasm shit. <laughs> <laughs> Woman's over there. She got the blindfold on him. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, uh, you think 93 is terrible? I think it ended terrible. It started off, as it progressed, it got better and better. And then it, it just seemed like it noticeably fell off at, at Ultra Clash. Well, obviously, I mean, Eddie was the primary driving force of the promotion. Um, he uh, he carried the company basically on his back for the first four months of the promotion. I mean, from April all the way until uh, September, uh, May, June, July, August. Okay, so the first five months of the promotion, it was all Eddie Gilbert and uh, trying to make guys. I mean, the only person he really made was Terry. If you want to call Terry Funk being made, but uh, he got over on TV. Um, but it was shaping up for Hot Stuff International to be the primary driving force of the promotion going forward. And Eddie leaving through everything in disarray. So everything's jumbled up for the tag team title situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the multiple tournaments they had, they had three tournaments in one year, I think. Um, the TV title is pretty much stable, but Sabu, you know, uh, I mean, he's, uh, it's not like he's going to be defending it because you rarely see him up until he jobs the, the belt. Um, and uh, the heavyweight title is in a, in a, in a secure place. Uh, it may not be on the oh, person you want it to be on. It's in a secure place? Ain't that some shit? I would have rather they left it on Sabu. You want a secure place? You put it on the freaking franchise. But unfortunately, the franchise is the reason why the belt is in the wrong hands right now. So I'm looking forward to the night the line was crossed. I'll say that. So, finish up 93. Promotion sucks, but there's glimmers of hope. Uh, the titles are ping-ponging all over the place. But the main event picture is pretty much secure. You got Funk, Sabu, and uh, Shane. And Funk's making these guys. I mean, week by week, he's making them. I mean, whether you like the guy or not, uh, it's very apparent that there is a clear focus on the top of the card, whereas, you know, everybody at the bottom of the card is just wasting the fuck away. Yeah. And when Eddie was booking, everybody had a feud from Tommy Cairo to Tony Hitman Stetson all the way up to Hot Stuff International. J.T. Smith was relevant. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'll keep watching. Overall, um, as a timeline, uh, it was very good. Oh, very yeah. introspective. Mm -hmm. um, Todd... Uh, marble mouthed his way through the three hours, but, <laughs> but it was very insightful. Uh, Sean kept him on track. Um, I definitely recommend watching it. Absolutely. Um, hopefully, you know, saying uh, we can do some extreme, extreme retro reviews of some TWA stuff and some oh, wow. and some early prior uh, pre Battle of the Belts shows. 
uh, Visceromania is not not uh, upload ECW shows any longer, so we'll have oh, to find wow. another avenue to get that fixed. But he done tapped out on us, right? But uh, for now, that's the that's the timeline. And when we come back, it'll be the inaugural 1993 ECW J. Sully Awards. Peace.